How to Grow and Navigate Your Career. Alita is Senior Vice President of Product and Partner Management for CDW. She's responsible for managing CDW's relationship with its community of industry-leading technology partners. In addition, she directs the day-to-day -day operations of CDW's procurement team, keeping a broad selection of technology readily available to, cons uh, to consumers and customers. Prior to returning to CDW in November 2013 as Vice President of Higher Education Sales, she served for three years as a National Partner Sales Executive at Microsoft. Joining her today in conversation, we have Hanadi, who is a Senior Manager, Employer Brand and Diversity at CDW, with the goal to help humanize and bring the brand to life. Hanadi joined CDW in 2015 as a recruitment marketing specialist with a deep background in traditional marketing and became manager in 2017. She's heavily focused on CDW's employee value position, amplifying voices on social and creating campaigns to attract, uh, to attract talent to CDW. Thank you all for joining today and please take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mariella. Welcome, everybody. CDW is really proud to be a partner of Power to Fly, and we're excited that you've joined today's session, How to Grow and Navigate Your Career with Aletha Noonan. So like um, Mariella said, my name is Hanati. I'm a Senior Manager for Employer Brand and Diversity. I'm really excited to be today's moderator for our speaker, Aletha. So she is a Senior Vice President of Partner product and partner management at CDW. For those who don't know, CDW is a leading technology solutions provider in the US, UK, and Canada. And with over 13,000 coworkers, we make technology work so that our customers can do great things. We're going to jump right into it, really, on talking on how the camera is always rolling. So, you know, Alita, you mentioned this concept or this notion of the camera is always rolling. Can you tell us what you mean by that and how has that helped you shape your career? Yeah, thank you. Um, hey, everybody, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I started my career um, in this industry in 1993. Um, so I have a strong point of view um, about how to navigate your career and maybe some pitfalls along the way to maybe I could give you some of my tips to avoid. But this concept of the camera is always rolling really sticks with me. And it's something I've, I've said for a while and I keep coming back to when you're looking for a job or your next job or more span of control or whatever it may be. The people who are judging you or making decisions on your career have been watching you all along the way. So philosophically, the camera is always rolling. I remember in college, my friend's dad was the CEO of a small company that he founded. And we would go visit him just a few hours away from where we were. So that was where we would sometimes go for a home cooked meal. And he would take us to go see a poetry reading or he would call one of his friends over and he would just always have these you know, conversations about leadership and about life. And I said, Mr. Getz, where did you meet all these great people? And the reality of it was he picked them up over time, you know, so the camera is always rolling, really starts on the playground and then it starts in the classroom. If you think about being a good um, peer to someone, if you're in a graduate class or an undergraduate class and that person later having the decision-making ability to refer you into their company or maybe even hire you on their team, you just never know. Um, if you think about those moments in time when somebody's struggling in their career and you're there as an advocate and a peer, you're, you're building this brand and this, and this impression. So when you go in for the job, rarely are we looking for, you know, are you going to get ready? And if you think about even how interview questions are asked, they're always asked on, on specific things that you've done along the way. And people who are in decision-making authority, big jobs like mine or um, a peer that's um, you know in your in your class maybe making observations about whether or not you'd be a good fit or an excellent fit or somebody to take a chance on. So I thought I'd start with just this cameras always rolling concept to say the interview had started, the um, background check has started, and whatever you're doing, whatever that may be, those impressions that you leave um, are really your reel of of interview or of consideration. And I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about my career, maybe tell you some of those moments in time that the camera rolling or people catching me or those small moments that mattered that really impacted my career. So I started in the industry, as I mentioned, in 1993. When I first got out of school, I spent just over a year at a, uh, um, a branch of a small pharmaceutical company. And I had... Um, it, when, and I'm originally from Ohio. I, I wanted to live in Illinois, so I worked for the person who ran the, the Illinois division. And eventually I decided I didn't want to live away from all the people I know and work from my home. So I, 
I moved to Chicago without a job, but I had great suits. So um, I actually, well, they were they were great starter suits for a 20 something year old. Um, so I would bring my resume with me as I was looking for a job and I was temping, but I would always dress up for, for the temp jobs. So one, one observation would be, you know, just even having good posture and what you're wearing or how your eye contact is and kind of putting yourself out there is a good thing. Now, granted, this was the 90s. So what was acceptable in the workplace has changed. You can tell today I'm wearing a very sophisticated uh, uh, CDW branded, I guess it's like a polo t-shirt kind of thing. It's a collarless, collarless polo, but look, you know, kind of looking the part and being available certainly matters. I happened to run into a man coming off of the elevator and I had, I was dressed in work attire and I had my resume in my hand. So that moment in time was really just kind of a, a an opportunity for me. And he said, you should consider going into technology. So the funny thing is I, I, I ended up working for this man. I ended up, um, he had about a $20 million um, services company and CDW was our uh, larger competitor, but slightly different. We both sold product, but this company did a lot more services. The people that were calling on that company, the, the channel leaders that were calling on that company were actually calling on CDW. I know some of them today. That was almost 30 years ago. So again, I started to leave an impression just then when I was liaising with them and I was, you know, I was an assistant buyer and a marketing assistant and I kind of did all things in the office, but I also had some relationships with some of the decision makers, um, some of the people that, that ran the business. So that's a, that's just an interesting tidbit. So over time I, I joined CDW, I was in the training class. I, um, you know, I had opportunity to be in, in sales leadership. I had the opportunity to help design and um, reboot some of our programs and design some of our sales training. At one point, I was the um, leader for our manager and training program and our team leader program, which was the emerging leaders portion of, you know, future people that could be in leadership. And at one point, I was asked to work on a project with one of our biggest partners. It was a um, person at Microsoft. And I was a senior manager and she was probably a director at the time. And, um, or I, you know, I feel like she was probably a little more seasoned than me in her career at the time. And this project was out of scope for my job responsibility. Um, but I had been asked to help solve it because I had demonstrated I had some good problem solving skills and we knocked it out of the park. So I worked with Lynn on this project. We knocked it out of the park. It was so much fun. And this is like circa 1997. We kind of brainstormed on what we wanted to do. We pushed the envelope for our two companies. We came back, we crafted a program that had never happened before in the business. And we both um, over exceeded our goal, our collective goals for the partnership. The reason I tell you that story is that um, I spent um, several more years at CDW and my second daughter was born in 2005. In 2005, I made the decision to stay home with her and my other daughter. So I had a two year old and a newborn um, and I stayed home for five years. When I came back to the industry, I reached out to different people um, to put my name in the hat because I'm like, I want to do, I can do certain things, but there's other things I'm less adept to, but I know CDW, I helped build the company. Um, and one of the people I called was Lynn Frankel, who was a general manager for Microsoft. She's one of the most senior people there. She actually designed the program of partnership with CDW and other partners like us. Um, and when I, when I emailed her, I didn't even know, you know, we were friendly, we stayed in touch. She had such a profound impact from something we had worked on eight years prior and she said, you could do my job, I'd hire you tomorrow. Well, I did have to go through this interviewing process, but that camera is always rolling concept really is there. So, you know, be, be present in your meetings, be present in your engagement, be respectful to your peers, to your, even the people inside your business, assume good intent and assume that those impressions you're leaving might impact your career, certainly impacted mine when I came back to work after staying home with my kids in um, 2010. And it was, a, it was a pretty life-changing opportunity for me to re-enter their workforce over 40, working for one of the world's most powerful companies. It's pretty exciting. I love that, Aletha. Thank you so much. And I think about, you know, the camera's always rolling. You've got this reel in the background of all your, you know, the highs and lows of your career. So it's nice that you think about it from that perspective and how can you potentially leverage that network in the future. And when I think about that, you know, you mentioned, you know, the reel, the camera, um, it really thinks about your brand. So brand obviously plays a huge role in how the camera is always rolling and how others are perceiving you. So how do you think about brand and how can an individual be more intentional about shaping their own personal brand? 
So, you know, you, you, we've all heard a lot about brand and it, and it really comes down to what others think about you. It doesn't really matter what you think about yourself. A personal brand is really just the point of view of others. It's what they think about you. It's how they've experienced you. It's how they recollect your character, your decision-making. It's how they talk about you when you're not in the room. So having a really strong point of view on your own brand and having that brand reconcile with who you want to be is important. So I think as we think about brand, it's not just about, I could say I'm, you know, a neat Nick and my husband would say, well, that's, that's not true. Because if you saw my, my closet, it just doesn't reconcile with who I am. But I could say, you know, I am um, a woman that's committed to helping other women and I want to be a role model for my teenage daughters. And although I may be an imperfect role model and I may not always do the best job at helping other women, um, it's something I aspire to be and it's something that I can, I can point to data points of what I've done and what I could do. And people see me trying to do that. I spent five years as a Girl Scout leader. I'm a lifetime member of the YWCA of Metropolitan Chicago's board. So your brand is, um, it's more than just kind of this fabrication of what you write down. It's really the, the checks and balance of what people say about you when you're not in the room. How a peer or a boss describes you of whether you'd be a good candidate for a specific job, an assignment. It's how people try to, you know, when your brand comes alive when we're trying to persuade someone on why to include you, why to add you to a business unit, why to give you a raise, why to give you more span of control, why to give you a shot of something you didn't know. It takes you know, as I think about the things I look for in people, it's not just in having a competency in the role. It's all those character elements of do they have followership? How have they behaved when they're stress tested? I always think about that one. You know, it's easy to perform when things are going well and you have all the top performers and everybody's a star player and everybody comes to work on time and does all the things. But how do you handle a situation, whether you're in leadership or in an individual contributor role? When things are, you know, a mess and challenging, I love to see how people respond to stress in the workplace and how they're how they're dignified and how they treat people or how they, you know, li really lean into solving the problem as opposed to here's everything that's wrong. So um, people make decisions about your brand and whether or not to hire you, to promote you, to work with you, to hire you as a, a consultant or to buy your product. So your brand matters. And I would say, the other thing I would say, and I, these, these one-sided conversations are hard to have, but you know, I, I would say that um, it's important to be reflective of your brand. Um, if you're getting notions, and there's ways to kind of get feedback from others, but if you're getting notions that people think you are inflexible or as a, for, for example, then you know, reflect on if flexibility is something you want to be better at, start talking about it and thinking about it. Um, how can you do be better at that? Get get people in your life that give you real, honest feedback. That's a safe place to give you feedback. You may not always agree with it, but remember, it's less about what you think of yourself, and it's more about what people think of you. Is this someone I can count on? I know there's some elements of my brand that are with me. You know, I'm I'm known as a problem solver. Literally, I'm known as a person. If you want to figure out how to get something done, call Alitha. But I talk about that too. So then, you know, people who are good with their brand creation and their brand evolution talk about like, I'm the gal you call if you want to solve a problem. I love complex problem solving and I can give examples of things that I've done. I'm the person you can say, I may not have all the answers, but you can count on me to follow up. If you pick one thing to be good at in any industry, do what you say you're going to do and follow up. Do what you say you're going to do and follow up. What a great thing to be known for. You know, those other people that you, you're like, I may or may not hear back from them. Oh, they scheduled this meeting with me, but it'll get canceled three times. Um, be the brand of whatever that is you're capable of, but reconcile your brand with the real you. And then, you know, it can be a little aspirational, but don't say you have a clean closet if, if, if you don't. I do have a clean closet, Elitha. I will send you a picture. But I'm glad to know um, that you talked, you know, talked to, touched on a lot of different topics about feedback and what people are saying about you when you're not in the room, how you respond to stress, how you, you know, respond to moments of good and bad. So I'm curious for feedback specifically, how do you how do you know where you stand with others and how can you get real feedback? Um, really kind of dig into it in terms of like what are the specifics that people can do to get that feedback from others? 
So I have, I have a, a lot of ideas on this subject, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with my the one that is just a that works time and time again, and it's really easy to implement. When you have a relationship with someone, a work relationship, whatever it may be, a really easy way to create a culture of feedback is to end your meetings with, "What would you like to see more of me or less of me? What can I do more of or less of?" It really doesn't feel so judgy, right? So because you, it's uncomfortable to ask for feedback that's what am I doing wrong? Nobody really wants to know what they're doing wrong, but it's a really softer way to say, what would you like to see more of or less of? How can I do, um, how, or, you know, that somebody in your business, a little less open-ended of how can I support you? It's how can I do, what would you like to see more of or less of? What can my team do more of or less of? Say it to your boss. What would you like to see more of or less of? I almost always get an answer. Sometimes it's, I want more of these meetings where you give me feedback on one, two, three. I want less uh, long emails and more summary, you know, summary type of email. So one really simple thing to do if you want feedback is to build that into your communication. Then the other thing I would say is, you know, having this point of view, I have this point of view about feedback. I believe in the power of moving the flywheel forward. And if you think about a flywheel, I think about like this really fast turning thing that you can just get moving and spinning really fast. And I can just imagine it. I heard uh, Jim Collins speak once and he talked this visually about this flywheel. And I've, I've never kind of lost that image of really successful feedback moves the flywheel forward. So it's a little like parenting. Um, you know, if you focus on what people do wrong when you're the feedback giver, whether it's up or over or down in terms of reporting structure, it just makes people go, oh, what else did I do wrong? But if you really want to have a feedback culture, start catching people doing the right things, regardless if they're more higher ranking than you. So for example, if you go to a meeting that's really effective and somebody says, um, you know, if you go to a meeting that's really effective and it's somebody in your company that you don't work for, and they're like, you know, that was a really good use of my time. I particularly like the way you set it up and you gave us handouts. That's, a, that's feedback that helps you and it helps that person. So modeling good feedback also is very specific to not you're doing a good job, but hey, um, Hanati, I appreciated it when you called me and we did a prep for this experience and the way that you outlined the slides made it really easy for me to consume. Next time, um, I don't even need the appendix because you did such a good job on the summary. That makes people feel good, but it also is really specific about spinning that flywheel. And then the other thing I would say it's tricky to get uncomfortable feedback. And I think it's important to have honest and direct relationships with people and to be very direct. And it's hard to do depending on where you are in your career, but calling somebody after an engagement that you feel didn't go well and just saying, you know, my intentions were to bring our business closer together. And I feel like we're off a beat, or I feel like we could do um, that I, I might've misrepresented because I was so passionate, I might have misrepresented you know, uh, my energy and not allowed you time to talk. So when things seem off, lean into them because you're, you know, you're the, the brand is what people say when you're out of the room, not just what they say when you're in the room. So, you know, lean into challenging conversations, things that seem off, uh, have some friends. So have some safe people, ask them for feedback. You know, I, I'll often say, um, and I remember one of the most senior people at our company thinks that I'm a good, pretty good speaker. And she would ask me during different sessions, she's like, can you watch me during this session? And will you give me feedback after? Really safe thing to do. So find people that you respect and say, you know, I'm trying to be more succinct and add more value to these meetings. Would you mind being listening in and giving me some feedback? It doesn't have to be a big boss. It could be somebody who's just whose opinion you value. So lots of good ways to get feedback, but open yourself up to feedback. If you get if you get a bunch of negative feedback at all at once, try to focus on the intent and not have your feelings hurt. Defensiveness doesn't get us anywhere because we're going back to, we want to, we want to be in a culture that moves the business forward. We want to be a person that people can count on. We want to be all those good things. And the challenging feedback sometimes shuts us down when really it should be, well, why did, why was that? How can I check in? So those are some ideas about feedback. 
Thanks, Letha. I love that. And I was going to email you and say, what feedback do you have for me? So I'm going to make sure I do that. So I got some good feedback here. Um, you asked, you said, you know, what can I do more of or what can I do less of? So thinking about the what can you do more of, how can you show flexibility while also balancing your boundaries? Are there good responses from this? This is a question from Brittany from the audience. Um, Brittany, I love that question because I think it's, um, it's more relevant than ever. Um, it's, if you create this culture that you're always available um, and you're not, or you just want to have a life, um, that's not great. So um, a couple of things. I, I don't know that, that I know all the answers. Obviously, I don't. But a couple of things. I think being proactive about your boundaries is a good thing to do. So, for example, um, I tell my team that when I'm on personal time, particularly with my family, um, that I don't check my email often but I will check it and they'll just have to send me a text if there's something that's time sensitive. The other thing I'll do, because sometimes I get loaded up with too many things to do at once, is I'll just check back on timelines and I, and I, I don't offer, well, I have to take my daughter to the hospital. I mean, I might say things like that to people that I'm close with, but that's not really anybody's business. But I'll say I have an unavoidable conflict um, however, can you give, it, would it be okay if I do this by Wednesday at noon instead of Tuesday at noon? And oftentimes people will say yes. So kind of creating those people in your culture that you can, I mean, in your um, work community that you can start having, uh, understanding their boundaries versus yours. And then this is a little trickier, especially if you're newer to career, but you'll sometimes work with people that are in some different life stages. So for example, an empty nester, Sometimes they're hard to work with because they have all the time in the world. My husband's at work. My kids are gone. I don't have a, a dog. I don't even have a fish to feed. So they're just available. I'll meet you at seven. I don't want to meet at seven. I will meet at seven in an emergency, but I don't want to meet at seven. So I think creating where you kind of have, you drip it in there to say, I'm very available. My preference is, you know, I prefer, I'm, you know, I, I'm, this isn't true, but I have, if I had small chill, children, I wouldn't prefer the mornings because I would want to get them ready for school. And I want to be a part of that whenever possible. But two o'clock, I'm jamming. So I may say, you know, lunch meetings are better for me as opposed to breakfast meetings. Or when I had babies and they went to bed at six, if there was a project that needed extra crunch time, I could do it in the evening. But I didn't want to do it right at dinner time. Again, being available from time to time is because your business demands it is different from having this kind of constant burn and churn and unpredictability. So maybe talk about predictability, give examples of, you know, talk about I'm super available. I want you to know I'm super committed. I'm going to be your star coworker, your star employee. And on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I do X, Y, Z and just start talking about it. I'll say one more thing. And I know we're, I, I don't want to lose any time here, but um, there was a, a CEO, I think it was a CEO of Coke or Pepsi a few years ago. It was when we were, it was before we were, I remember the office I was in, it was before the pandemic. But there was this guidance to leaders to lead loudly because we all go to our kids' ball game. We all have an after thing we like to do or a favorite concert we want to go see, things that maybe creep into a normal work day. So if you are in the circumstance that you are in a position of leadership, you know, it's it's nice to sometimes share that you have a life too. I remember when I first had my daughter, there were very few women in technology, certainly very few women with children. Many of them had stay-at-home husbands. When I found out they had three nannies, it made me feel so much better because I'm like, I don't know how you do it all. So when you start finding out people have other support or that, you know, underneath their desk, their closet may be messy, it's kind of humanizing. Um, so whatever position you're in, I think, striving for some predictability, talking about your boundaries, and you can balance it with, I am very committed and this is what commitment looks like for me. I love that. Thanks, Aletha. And I know we only have a couple minutes left, so we'll get to wrapping up just shortly. You talked about obviously building those boundaries and setting that communication, maybe sharing that with leaders or managers if this is when you're available and this is when you're not. Um, I think that's such an important part of CDW's culture and just how we've cultivated you know, our communication, our people, those are such unique differentiators. And then with that is also that career development or talent development. So can you talk about how CDW has approached talent development and what's your view of it? Yeah. So um, I also see a question here because I happen to have that chat open. I'm so not good at chat. Um, what advice would you give someone starting out or Gen Z? I don't know all the gens. I don't even know which one I am um, on career navigating. So I can answer this kind of Perfect. twofold. Um, 
One is take advantage of everything your company offers. If you, when you have the time, use the time. You know, if you are in a moment in time where you have a little extra time or you're interested in, you know, bringing your career up, be prepared to put in the extra time. You know, put in the, this is my work day and this is my professional development I want to get ahead day. So take advantage of those things. So for example, CDW, we have business resource groups. The one uh, dirty little secret about business resource groups is that nearly all the executives support all of them and attend some of their sessions. So if you want to get access to leaders and learn from kind of how they think, you can be sure that there will be a member of your senior leadership team in any kind of business resource group. So CDW is, has um, you know, a varying set of business resource groups. We have them for our diverse co coworkers. We have them for coworkers depending on where they are in their career. We have them for coworkers who um, you know, served in the military. They're not exclusive to that group that you identify with. But being a part of those groups gives you access to people and knowledge and professionalism, all the things that they're trying to do. So I would just say, as you're navigating your career, think about how can I tap into some of the things that um, my company offers. So, you know, CDW, our, our differentiator in the workplace is talent. And we could always do a better job of supporting our talent, developing our talent, but it is where we invest the majority of our um, energy. If we serve our talent, we will serve our customers. And ultimately, that's the, that's the secret sauce. So how do we make sure that we fuel the flywheel of our talent? And some of the things that we do on a big level is we have a thing called talent review. So nearly every coworker goes through a talent review. And the spirit of that is to make sure coworkers have the opportunity to hear what are they doing well? What is their career path? What else? Are we, what would we like to see more of or less of? And it's, again, it's not just this review period. It is a, a open discussion between the leaders at different levels. So, you know, I'll do talent review. We do it across org talent review where we look at all of the senior level leaders in the company as an executive member of CDW. I, I have a discussion at least twice a year about um, just sort of our talent in aggregate. And then we'll talk on, we'll talk about stars. We'll talk about somebody who, you know, we, we specifically do talent review, review of diverse coworkers. What are we doing to better support our diverse coworkers? Somebody asked a question about um, the groups that are marginalized. You know, we look at, well, we, we, do a, we do a slice when we do our reviews. We do a slice of saying, why is it that, you know, black women got a 5% raise and um, men with less than under 40 only got a 2% raise? Is there something we're doing? Is there an inherent bias or whatever it may be? So we do those things. Talent is a, is a, um, is a priority of ours. And all of us from the senior leaders all the way down to any people leader have talent as a, um, a really specific metric. And it's not just a metric, it's what are you doing to preserve, accelerate high performing talent and how are we supporting so that everybody at CDW can realize their greatest career potential. I love that. Thanks so much, Alifa. I know we're close to time. So I wanted to thank everyone so much for attending the session. Thank you, Alifa, for your time today. A couple things that you could walk away with this. Um, you know, obviously think about your cameras are always rolling. What are people saying about you when you're not in the room? What is your personal brand and what do you want to stand for? Ask for feedback, ask for it often. Make sure you get your, um, your friends or those who you trust and get solicit their feedback as well. And then lastly, just how can you make sure that you're taking advantage of all the resources that you have at your organization? So just a couple of nuggets for you. Um, we hope you learned a few tips and tricks from this session and how to grow and navigate your own career. If you are interested in learning more about CDW and joining the team, please visit us on Thursday for the virtual career fair. Thank you all so much. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you, Mariella. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mariella. Both. Yes, thank you both for sharing knowledge. Um, such a wonderful session. I appreciate the two of you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take good care.